Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first worship service of the Tierra Santa Church in the year 2021. If this is your first time with us, we thank you so much for joining us and hope that this will be a regular part of your Sabbath worship. Of course, online you can watch the service at any time, either on Sabbath, Sunday, Monday, any day of the week. But I know for a lot of you, you like to do it during the Sabbath hours. So we're here to provide you with some inspiration, some food for thought some meditation, and we hope that you will enjoy the experience. So here we are in a new year, 2021. I know a lot of you are thinking, good riddance, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. There is one particular hymn in our church hymnal that is, in my view, a New Year's song, and it's entitled, O oh God, Our Help. God, our help in ages past and our hope for years to come. So it kind of looks back and then looks forward. And so I would like to sing for you this wonderful song based on the 90th Psalm uh, written by Isaac Watts in the year 1719. O oh God, our help. <laughs> Our hope for years 
The holidays are still with us, even though New Year's Day has come to an end. Uh, many, many Christians around the world, numbering in the millions, still celebrate this time, which we call the 12 days of Christmas, ending with the Feast of the Epiphany, the time when the uh, Magi visited the baby Jesus and uh, he appeared to them. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful time. And, um, uh, and so we're still celebrating the holidays here at the McCary home. We still have our, our holiday tree up and uh, hope that you enjoy a little bit of this feeling of, of the holidays. Um, each and every Sabbath, I like to recommend something for you to read. And today I'm gonna recommend a book that, when I was a kid, we call these picture books later on known as coffee table books, as people would have them on their coffee tables. Um, it is a wonderful book that's not just full of fantastic photos, but full of, of, uh, of stories and, uh, and of history. And uh, it, it is basically a book about the history of astronomy from beginning until now. And so it is entitled The Universe by Leo Marriott. This book is spectacular. Of course, our universe is spectacular. It's very big. <laughs> it's huge and still growing. And this book just covers all of the history of astronomy with these wonderful uh, photographs of, of uh, the heavens that uh, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, has taken for many, many decades. You will love this particular book, I guarantee you. And if you know very little of astronomy, it's a good primer. It gives you a good feel for, for what, uh, what astronomy does as one of the sciences. It's just a, a fantastic contribution to humanity. So uh, I highly recommend The Universe by Leo Marriott. And uh, I think this will, this will enhance your understanding of the heavens. You know, when, uh, when the psalmist wrote about the heavens, he said, you know, when I look at the heavens, what is man that you are mindful of him? W what are we humans that you give us any thought when you think about how, and, and he didn't have any concept of how large the heavens were. He just saw what was up in the sky. Um, and so that is a theological question. And this, in that sense, this book on the universe is a theological treatise. So, the Universe by the great Leo Marriott. I think you'll enjoy this book immensely. <clears throat> um, I think we, we, have, uh, we still have an unopened gift under our tree. So I would like to go over and open this gift up and take a look at what's in here and see if it's something that we could all benefit from. So let's see. I love this gift box and this beautiful red bow. And uh, so we're going to take a look here and see what we have in our gift. We could call this our epiphany gift, couldn't we? Ah, yes. More great gifts for all of us. The gift of people and names. I would like to mention the names that are the gift inside of the gift box. Uh, I see Evangeline, and Tammy, and David, Adam, and Ellen, Moisey, and Daisy, and Lyric, Catalina, Robert, Jane, Reno, and Febby, Raymond, and Adolfo, Abdiel, Vashti, Reuben, Wendy, Ed, Karen, Kelly, and Tara, and Richard, and Susan, and Amber, and I see Kathleen, and Eddie, and David, and Suzanne, and Ingrid. What wonderful, wonderful names. And I hope that uh, you all feel somewhat special, that you will hear your name from time to time as we uh, go through the year. Um, these names are so near and dear to us. You know, the Tierra Santa Church is a church family. Those of you who are watching from around the country who are part of different church families, you know how important it is to have that community that you can relate to and that loves you and cares for you. And I hope that that is your situation. We at the Tierra Santa Church do what we can when we find out there's a need 
someone to pray for, someone to help financially, someone who really is in dire straits. A family wants to help. We want to help. And so uh, I hope that you sense that wherever you are because that's the real importance of the church. The real importance is the family aspect of it. Um, the most important entity in the Christian faith is the local church. That's more important than any other level of administration. The local church is where it's at. And uh, we at the Tierra Santa Church prioritize that and do the best we can to try to make that uh, something that's tangible and a reality in people's lives and that is truly meaningful and helpful and practical. And so uh, we mention these names every week. We go through all of the names of our church members and friends that you've, names you've given us uh, that would like to be on the list. If you would like to add names to this list of people that I see from time to time in my, my magic mirror or in our gift box, please let me know. We'll add those names to the list. Well, before our sermon today, we certainly want to pray for people. Um, I'd like you to continue to pray for my best friend, Dennis. Uh, he lives about 100 miles away from San Diego and recently had a uh, brain surgery for a tumor on the right side of his brain. He's recovering nicely. Thank you for remembering him in your prayers. Let us continue to remember the families of Netta Clay. Um, she had lost her mother, Inga. Um, and the McMillan family who lost Sydney, uh, they're still in mourning. And uh, certainly this will be a difficult holiday season for them. And uh, remember the name Mary Betts. Mary is a wonderful part of our church family. Her husband Chobby was our office manager for many years and uh, he passed away a few years ago. Mary uh, is doing the best she can but she has lots of, of physical challenges and problems. So please keep her in your prayers. Um, uh, Agatha Munson lost her sister recently. And Fred and Agatha right now are back in South Carolina with the family. They'll be coming back around uh, uh, next week sometime, he tells me. But keep uh, the family of the Munsons in your prayers. Uh, so before our sermon today, let's pause for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Parent, we thank you for the gift of life. Here we are in a new year, and a year certainly that will have many challenges, uh, but also many opportunities. And uh, I pray that you will assist us all as we make it through this year, as we navigate uh, uncharted waters, and that we will return to some sense of normalcy before this year is out. We pray for all the families of those who have lost loved ones in our church and ask you to comfort them. We pray for those who have lost family members due to uh, someone dying of the uh, COVID virus. Uh, many, many hundreds of thousands of people have died, not only in our country, but around the world. And uh, we pray that you will give them some sense of comfort during this time. Uh, as we open your word, give us clarity, give us perspective as we approach uh, the new year. And uh, we thank you that you're with us at all times, that you are our God, who has been our God in ages past, and you will be our hope for years to come. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of today's sermon is uh, Teach Us to Number Our Days. Teach Us to Number Our Days. It is based on the 90th Psalm, which is what our song, O God, Our Help, is based on. But on, in the 12th verse, the psalmist says, Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days aright. In other words, to put them in proper perspective, to see how important certain things are and how unimportant other things are, to, to number these things correctly so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. It's good to be smart. It's good to be clever. It's good to be funny. But what's more important than all of those things is wisdom. Wisdom. To have wisdom will give you 
a leg up on those who are simply smart because wisdom takes into consideration context. It takes into consideration all of the things that just being smart wouldn't necessarily give you. And it makes life more uh, meaningful to have a heart of wisdom. There was a song written many years ago by one of the members of a group called Monty Python over in England. It's a funny little song. It's entitled, Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. And uh, I've always loved the words of this song since I first heard them. You know, I'm a positive person. I'm a sort of a glass half full type of person. And this song resonated with me. We've just come from a really interesting year, 2020, in which uh, we, had, we had a lot of ups and downs, a lot of confusion, a lot of angst, still suffering from the angst. But listen to the words of this song, which are clever, funny, perhaps uh, helpful, maybe not. You decide. The title of the song, again, is Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. So here we go. Some things in life are bad. They can really make you mad. Other things just make you swear and curse. When you're chewing on life's gristle, don't grumble, give a whistle. And this'll help things turn out for the best. And always look on the bright side of life. If life seems jolly rotten, there's something you've forgotten. And that's to laugh and smile and dance and sing. When you're feeling in the dumps, don't be silly chumps. Just purse your lips and whistle. That's the thing. And always look on the bright side of life. Come on, always look on the bright side of life. For life is quite absurd, and death's the final word. You must always face the curtain with a bow. Forget about your sin, give the audience a grin. Enjoy it, it's your last chance anyhow. So always look on the bright side of, of death. And just before you draw your terminal breath, you'll see it's all a show. Keep them laughing as you go. Just remember that the last laugh is on you. And always look on the bright side of life. Always look on the bright side of life. Come on, cheer up. Always look on the bright side of life. Well, I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, that's easy for them to say. Things were probably going pretty good when they wrote that song and when they recorded that song. Perhaps. But there's a message there. It's a certain perspective to have. There are many perspectives to have on life. And the person who wrote our book of Ecclesiastes, which in Hebrew is Koheleth, <laughs> which means the preacher or the teacher, uh, the person who wrote it had a certain perspective on life. And maybe you haven't read Koheleth or Ecclesiastes in a while. Perhaps you've never read Ecclesiastes. So I'd like to read the first couple of chapters for you, just to give you a, uh, a little tidbit of the perspective of this author, probably writing about um, you know, at least 2,500 years ago, maybe 3,000 years ago, a long time ago. Uh, it's a Hebrew or a Jewish person. Um, he says that he is uh, uh, the, the son of David. Um, so let's hear what he has to say. And if you want to look along in your own Bible, just turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I think from time to time it's always good to meditate on these words and to put them in perspective and to decide, do you buy into this or don't you buy into this? So let's read Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does man gain from all his toil at which he toils under the sun? Generations come and generations go, 
but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was already here long ago. It was here before our time. There is no remembrance of men of old, and even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. What a heavy burden God has laid on men. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after wind. What is twisted cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I thought to myself, look, I have grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is foolish, and what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was worthwhile for men to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well, the delights of the heart of man. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward for all my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Well, you get the drift of where the author is going. In verse 17 of chapter 2, he comes to some sort of concluding statements that I'd like to read for you. He says, So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool? Yet he will have control over all the work into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he must leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days, his work is pain and grief. Even at night, his mind does not rest. This, too, is meaningless. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This, too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. 
but to the sinner he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. And then the author goes right into that very famous passage where he says there's a time for everything under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, so you know all of that. And then he concludes that thought with, he has made everything beautiful in its time. I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and to do good while they live. And so he goes on and on like this. You sense that he is a little bit cynical, a little bit disappointed perhaps. He had everything that you could want. He had won the lottery. He had an unlimited reservoir of resources, of money, of people, of slaves, of property. He had everything. And he says, my conclusion is, it's all, as the King James Version says it, it's all vanity, meaningless. A modern interpreter has interpreted it, that, that Hebrew word, cotton candy. It's all cotton candy. But the one thing, the one thread that goes through Ecclesiastes in almost every chapter is these little snippets, these little concluding snippets that the author makes. There's nothing better for a person to do than to eat and to drink and to find enjoyment in one's life. Well, certainly that is good counsel. I'm not sure I buy into all the negative skepticism that he has about life, but again, I'm, for whatever reason, I am constitutionally a glass half full person. I am a positive thinker for the most part. And I know many of you are too, but not all of you are. It seems that some of us constitutionally are glass half empty. We're skeptical. We're, we're sometimes prone to depression for whatever reason. This is part of the human experience. I think wisdom is, to have wisdom is to be able to take that skepticism, to take that uh, depression, to take that moroseness, um, and to turn it a little bit, look at it in context, and then to be somewhat even keeled. So the Hebrew people were people uh, who certainly embraced the thought of eating and drinking and partying. When we think of New Year's, we think of a great big party. People have New Year's Eve parties, New Year's Day parties. It's a time to celebrate. And certainly in Israel's existence, and now we get back to the Old Testament, uh, to the people who were wandering in the wilderness under Moses for 40 years, they certainly embrace this type of thing. Let me read to you in Deuteronomy some counsel that Moses gives to the people found in Deuteronomy chapter 14, uh, starting with verse 22. This is really interesting. Listen to this. Be sure to set aside a tenth, that is a tithe, of all that your fields produce each year. Set aside a tenth of it. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine and oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name. In other words, the tabernacle. But if that place is too distant, if the tabernacle is too far away, and you have been blessed by the Lord your God and cannot carry your tithe because that place is so far away, then exchange your tithe for silver and take the silver with you and go to the place the Lord your God will choose, that is, the tabernacle. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, or other fermented drink, or anything you wish, and then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. And do not neglect the Levites, that is, those who were priests, for they have no allotment or inheritance of their own. The counsel is to, at the end of the year, take a tenth of all that you have and basically have a big party, eating and drinking and celebrating. In the Jewish economy, it was that way. They found every excuse they could for celebrations, for festivals, festivities. They had a celebration at the beginning and the end of every month. They had a celebration at least once every month. And of course, they had the grand celebrations of the Passover, and the Feast of Weeks uh, every year. Lots and lots of festivities with lots of food and lots of drink. And so the author of Ecclesiastes is saying, 
Even though all is vanity, all is meaningless, what I have discovered is there's nothing better than to eat and to drink and to find enjoyment in one's work. And this is our task, this is our challenge in 2021. We can look back, we can, in the midst of this pandemic, and we're still in it, and we'll be in it for a while longer, we can say this is just, this is a waste. This is awful. This is meaningless. And yet, from the perspective of wisdom, we can say, and yet, it's good to find enjoyment in one's work, wherever one can find it in one's life. Find that enjoyment. Do something. Whatever it takes, do something for that enjoyment. And eat and drink and enjoy one's life as far as possible. I have three suggestions for you as to how to make this time more fruitful. Um, call somebody on the phone. You know, we don't use our phones enough to communicate with people uh, who we love and who haven't heard from us for a while. Make some phone calls to people who you know are lonely and cheer them up. You will, you will feel better and they will feel immense pleasure. Number two, identify some small things that you could celebrate weekly or daily Perhaps the mastering of a new skill, learning how to paint, or uh, your grandchild's or child's passing a test, help them to pass their test. Uh, grow something in a garden, grow a vegetable garden or a flower garden. And then number three, one day a week, eat something that you love to eat. One day a week, eat something that you love to eat. Dress up in really nice clothes just for the fun of it. You know, have your own personal uh, fashion show in your living room. Do something fun, and it will lift you out of the doldrums. So here we are in a new year, a new year in which we have lots of challenges ahead of us. But as the psalmist advises us, let's learn to number our days. Each day is a separate gift from God, and we don't know how many days left we have, any of us. Certainly, those of us who are older, those days are getting fewer and fewer and fewer till the end. But even those of, those of you who are younger, you don't know what tomorrow brings. And so, Lord, teach us to number our days and to put things in their proper perspective. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Heavenly Parent, we embark now on a new year, a new calendar year in which we're hoping for a fresh start and to see things more clearly, to love more deeply and to follow you more closely. So may this be a productive year for all of us and teach us day by day to number our days aright that we might gain a heart of wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have arrived at this new year, and you have shared part of it with me, this second day of the new year. And so I ask you to join me this year in being a thankful people, a grateful people, a people who put things in perspective. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich.